Okay, if we could turn, please, to the book of Joel once again, and chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 12 through 17, which are really the watershed of this entire uh, epistle or book, really, Old Testament prophecy. Uh, everything turns on this little section here. Uh, up to now, we've said that it's all about barrenness. It's all about the fact that uh, here's a uh, people that uh, have experienced uh, tremendous, devastating blows, and more is to come unless there's brokenness. And so this is kind of the valley of brokenness. This is where they get repentant before the Lord, and then we move into a time of unprecedented blessing. And so as we consider this, we want to title verses 12 through 17, Sincere Repentance, Sincere Repentance. So beginning in verse 1, it says, or verse 12, should I say, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meal offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word to us uh, this morning. This uh, this little section, 12 through 17, divides nicely into two portions, uh, 12 through 14, and then 15 through 17. And in both of those sections, there's kind of a question uh, that kind of ends them. And so the first section, 12 through 14, ends with this question, who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? So there's kind of a, a, a question of hope here. Hopefully, if we repent, the Lord will respond in a, in a very wonderful way. And so he'll, he'll, he'll leave us a blessing. So who knows if he will return and repent, leave a blessing. And remember that they've been threatened by a second locust invasion. They've already had one. And the Lord is saying there's another one coming. And the only way that they could possibly alleviate this happening is through sincere repentance. And so there's there's hope here in this question. The second, verse 15 through 17, uh, again, ends with a question. And, of course, the, the question is uh, given to us. He says uh, here at the end of verse 17, Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? And so it's one of concern. If, if another locust plague comes what what are what are the pagan world going to do they're going to look at us you know we, we are supposed to be in this covenant with god and this part of this covenant with god is that that he's going to bless us and if we're we have two severe plagues one after another how are the heathen going to look at us what are they going to say to us uh, are, are they going to question where is their god because look at how bad things are for them and so it's a question that is a concern about the name of God. How is this going to affect his testimony, his name? Uh, what kind of a God treats his people like this might be the question that would be asked. So just kind of interesting to notice those questions. We'll look at them in more detail as we go. But we want to begin with verse 12 in this phrase, therefore. In the light of what we saw in our last study, the promise of a second and more severe locust invasion, one that would be absolutely unprecedented in history. How are they supposed to respond to that? What is what is a fitting response to the threat of serious judgment upon the people of God? 
And the response is this, therefore also now. And I want you to notice the first thing that he wants them to do is not to delay in responding in repentance. Therefore now. Uh, uh, it's really Im important, isn't it, that we encourage people to do things now, not to put them off, not to put things off, especially something as serious as repentance. Don't put it off. Uh, I remember, again, I just read this amazing biography of D.L. Moody, and uh, one Sunday night he had preached the gospel, and he told people to go away and think about it and come back next Lord's Day. Well, that night, what the great Chicago fire was uh, happened, and who knows how many of those people who were present lost their lives. And Moody learned a vital lesson through that. And so he said he would never give a message without calling people to immediate repentance. And of course, that's a very important thing, isn't it? Uh, because uh, we, we see that in, in Scripture too. Uh, God commends, uh, commands all men everywhere to repent in the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And when uh, is this to happen? Well, let's look at a, a familiar scripture from a previous study in 2 Corinthians and chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 6, where we read these words, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse, um, verse 2. It says, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so there, there ought to be in all of us, uh, as we preach, that sense of urgency in calling men to repentance. Right? Not, not telling them to go away and think about it, but to respond now. And so he says, therefore, now, now is the time. Uh, now, of course, uh, their, their call to repentance based on the threat of this severe second plague. And what God is showing us here is that it doesn't make the repentance any less valid because they had been scared into it by a threat of a second judgment. Think about how many people are going to be in heaven because they were scared. I, I've heard so many testimonies in my lifetime of people, especially when they were young, and they, they'd they been hearing teaching on the, the rapture of the church and that God was going to snatch away his people and they woke up in the night and it was eerily silent in the house and they were panicking. I wonder if mom and dad have been snatched away and we're left behind. And in their response to this, uh, many of them had called on the name of the Lord and been saved because they didn't want to be left behind. Lots of people, I believe, will be in heaven because of fear of being left behind at the rapture. There are a lot of people going to be in heaven because of fear of hell and the and the subsequent eternal torment. Now, I'm one of them. Uh, the very thought of the fact that I was deserving of going to hell and that realization, uh, that was a huge motivating force in my mind of, uh, I can't save myself. I have to find an answer to this. I know I'm going to hell. And, and, uh, and it was, yes, it was fear, but it was, it was sufficient to bring genuine repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. And so we ought not to uh, lose sight of that, that it's, it's not wrong to cause people to wake up to the seriousness of their condition and call them to repent because of what is coming upon them. And, and so he says, therefore, also now. And notice who's saying this. Saith the Lord. And now I want you to notice that this is so personal. It says, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and mourning. And so he's calling them to sincere repentance. And the first part of sincere repentance is this, turning to God. Turn 
unto me. Now, in turning to God, it implies turning away from their sin because that's what had broken that relationship with the Lord in the first place, right? Their sin had caused the separation. And so they're called to turn to God, but it implies uh, turning away from sin as well, because that is why they were in the condition they were in, the, the sin of apathy, the sin in their case, the sin of taking things for granted, of going through the motions, of dead ritualism, and they'd gotten away from the Lord. They were just kind of going through the, this routine, and the Lord says, turn to even to me, and then he says, with all your heart. So the way of escape involves a turn. And the Lord introduces himself in the first person, turn even to me. This is the idea of sincerity and repentance. Turn in to me, an appeal made by the Lord uh, that he promises to meet them if they will turn. It's kind of interesting how the Lord is saying, turn to me, I'm there. I'm, I'm waiting for you. I love this. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God. And what's the promise? He will draw near to you. He's just waiting for you to draw near. And he says, I'll be there. I'm waiting for that. I want that. And so uh, this very personal promise here, the Lord turned to me with, and then he says, with sincerity, with all your heart, giving everything you can to surrender to God with all your heart. Now, I want you to think about this idea of the heart for a moment. Turn to me with all your heart. Of course, it, it, it has the idea of the sum total of the personality, everything to do with the man. Let me just prove that to you. One of the things I've, I've found really helpful in recent times, uh, and I found it really a blessing to my soul, is to always look at the principle of first mention. And it really does open up an understanding. So the first time heart is mentioned in Scripture, I want you to look at it in Genesis 6 and verse 5. And we're going to look at the first few mentions of the heart in the word of God. And we'll notice that it, it, it really gives a good definition of what God means by the heart. And so the first one is Genesis 6, verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so here... It's kind of the intellect, right? Every The heart is speaking of the intellect. Every imagination of his heart, every thought of his heart, imagination of the thoughts of his heart. So it's thinking of the intellect. The, the man's intellect is kind of controlling him, and he's thinking evil thoughts continually. Genesis 6.6, 6, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, the heart is an emotion, right? And God is, grief is an emotion. And and again, we, we, we're staggered, actually, I think, I, I hope we're staggered by the fact that human conduct can emotionally affect God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, right? There's an example where we potentially can bring grief to the Spirit of God or a, a member of the Godhead. Here, uh, the people's wickedness was causing grief to the heart of God, the creator. Amazing, isn't it? I wonder how many times I bought, brought, personally brought grief to the heart of God or the Holy Spirit by my conduct. Terrible to think of, but it's an emotion. And so now look at chapter 8, Genesis 8. So we've got the intellect, we've got the emotion. Chapter 8, verse 21, third reference. The Lord has smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. And the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. So notice again here, the Lord smelt a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not. So now the will is connected with the heart, right? God is saying, I will not. So in other words, he's exercising his will not to judge the earth again with a flood. And so basically, what we can see here is the first three references, you've got intellect, you have emotion, you have will. That's the entire personality. 
And so when God says, turn to me with all your heart, what he's saying is, turn to me with your entire personality. Everything that makes up you with your intellect, with your emotion, with your will, turn to me sincerely with all your heart. And so it's the whole of a person's moral character. And here the repentance is deep and radical. And of course, it's marked by action. Notice it says again here, uh, the Lord says, uh, turn ye even to me with all your heart. And then it says with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. So there's both action, that's fasting, and there's emotion, weeping and mourning. Now, not every act of repentance will include fasting and weeping, uh, but certainly act, action and emotions will be involved if it's genuine repentance. And, and so what we could say is, as we look at repentance, there's sincerity in genuine repentance. There's a measure of self-denial in repentance, in, at least in this case, there's there to turn with fasting, doing without legitimate things. And the thought is this, this issue is so serious. <laughs> you, you, you need to take it seriously. You need to do without legitimate things to get right with God, because what's coming is much worse than going without a meal, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's the potential of going without many meals, right? Because if this judgment comes of this second uh, locust invasion, you may not be eaten for months. <laughs> so this is there's an urgency here. There's a there's a legitimate idea of going without something legitimate to seek God and get this matter taken care of. And so things that normally would be considered important are put aside, and the the whole of the attention is devoted to seeking God. Now again, we've we've said this before, but I I think uh, although. Fasting is not commanded in the New Testament. What we could say is that it definitely was practiced in the New Testament. And so a couple of references that we'd be familiar with, the book of Acts and chapter 13, we see here that uh, there is definitely some fasting going on. In verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, this is the church at Antioch. It's primarily a Gentile assembly, and they're they're seeking, the, they're ministering to the Lord and fasting. And as they do that, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul to the work whereunto I have called them. And notice verse 3, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So clearly, the early Christians practiced fasting as part of their activity. Um, the Lord Jesus in Matthew 17 would give us some reasons why we should consider fasting. And here's one of them in Matthew 17 and verse 21. Now, it's interesting that not all uh, Bible translations include this verse. Uh, some of the more modern translations do not have it in at all, even though 99.9% .9 of all texts have it. <laughs> three don't. And so they choose the three over the 99.9% .9 that do have it. And uh, part of it is that they, whatever their logic is, um, they chose to go with those other three. But here, it just makes so much sense. It says, let me just read the context. Um, uh, he says, Jesus said to them, verse 20, because of your unbelief, for verily I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. In other words, there are some spiritual strongholds that are so deep rooted that it requires extra measures. I call this God's bunker busting bomb. <laughs> In other words, when things are, are so entrenched <laughs> and so deep rooted, here's something that can dislodge it. This cometh out not but by prayer and fasting. And so clearly there are uh, examples in the New Testament where the, the believers are called to fast and, and practice fasting, even though it's not commanded. Uh, it's certainly commended 
if it's not commanded. <laughs> I think that's a good way of putting it. Com commended rather than commanded. So notice here this voice of the Lord uh, speaking to them here in verse um, the very same Lord whose voice was heard in verse 11. Notice verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army is now used again, no longer commanding the invading army, now giving his covenant people a way of escape. Therefore also, and now saith the Lord, the same commander of this army, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, with mourning. Of course, there's sorrow in repentance, isn't there, as well? Not only is there self-denial connected with it, there's sorrow. And so this weeping because of the condition, because of the testimony, uh, and the barrenness connected with the testimony, there's genuine sorrow. And of course, we again, we're reminded in, in 2 Corinthians 7 about godly sorrow. There's genuine sorrow here. And so they're, they're weeping as well. All the emotions are involved and so very, very interesting response here. Now notice verse 13. This is where we emphasize the sincerity yet further. He says, and rend your heart and not your garments and turn to the Lord your God for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger of great kindness, repent them of the evil. So rend your heart, not your garments. Because in the Jewish uh, culture, one of the ways they expressed mourning was the tearing of the clothes. And they're, they're very dramatic people. You know, they're, they're, this is, you just can Im imagine the drama of it, just tearing their garments and kind of, and they, they, they do that kind of stuff. And they're, they're, they're very dramatic people. And so that was part of their, one of their expressions of mourning. And it was a way to say, I am so overcome with grief that I don't care if my clothes are ruined and I look bad, right? In other words, the grief is so serious. And often uh, they would put on sackcloth, they would cover themselves with ashes, they do all these different things. So you can see that there's there's a picture here that's been, been shown of, of an, an outward expression of grief. But Joel knew that somebody could tear their garments without tearing their heart. In other words, they could go through the motions yet again. See, part of their problem was going through the motions, and they could even go through a ritual like this and just go through the motions and not be real, not be genuine. And so he wants reality, not externality. I want you to just get that in your mind. Reality, not just externality. Not just an outward show, but an inner reality. That's what he's looking for. And it's so easy to put on the outward show. I mean, in, just at any level, even in, in our uh, meetings, it's so easy to, we know what people expect. We know how to dress. We know how to act. And we can put on the outward show and yet not be real at all. Uh, the Lord would say, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he's quoting from Isaiah. Uh, he mentions it in Matthew 15, 8, but he's quoting directly from Isaiah 29 and verse 13. And of course, it's always a danger for all of us, isn't it? To, to come before the Lord and say the right things and give the right expressions, and yet in our hearts to be far from him. And so he wants this to be genuine. Rend your heart, not your garments. Rend your heart, not your garments, to be more than just the externals. It, it, it implies a people distressed of soul. And the Lord is more interested. In fact, the one thing the Lord cannot resist is a broken and a contrite spirit. And that's what he wants. He just wants people to get real with him. Be honest in his presence. Take our sin seriously. Admit the gravity of it. Be real, not justify it, not excuse it, not blame. And, and cause today, everything's designed in our culture today to excuse things. 
it was my environment it was this it was that it was it was my parents it was any excuse except taking responsibility for your own actions and again that's part of the the whole satanic deception i believe of the whole psychological movement is to get men to try and come up with excuses for their sin it was the woman thou gavest me that's what psychology is it's it's a way of blaming it on somebody else instead of taking responsibility for your own actions god wants us to get real and get responsible and when we do that he can't resist that. He he loves it when people just get honest in his presence. We we're just talking recently about God calling to Adam, where are you? Is Did God know where he was? Of course God knew where he was. Why did he ask him that question? It's not that he's not looking for it. He, he's given him an opportunity to get real and get honest and say to the Lord, Lord, I've sinned. And that's what he wants from us. And so we think of that in the context of... Uh, our own conditions is is there barrenness in our meetings could it be that 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 our coldness of heart our going through the motions could have contributed to the barren state of things in our meetings is that a possibility and if it is then god wants us to get honest he wants us to be real to take our sin seriously the repentance was more than just a departing from the evil, though. It was also a turning to the Lord. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God. That's what they're called to do, to, to get back into that happy fellowship with the Lord, that relationship with him where they're enjoying him, encouraging them in their homecoming and to assure them of a welcome. And to do that, what Joel does is he gives a lovely description of God's character so that we'd want to go back to him. What kind of a God is it that wants our fellowship so much? And so he says, turn unto the Lord your God, and then he begins to list some of the characteristics of our God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. And so this idea of repentance, it's really rooted in the, in, in the character of God. The reason that we're called to repent is so because God is a God who responds to that kind of brokenness and repentance. It's his character that would draw us back to him. It's not the sinner's repentance that makes God merciful. He already is that. But the sinners turning to God affords God the opportunity to display his compassion so richly and so righteously. So the appeal to turn is grounded in what he is. And so first of all, it says he is gracious. By the way, don't we love grace? I hope we love the characteristic of the grace of God. Grace is the free bestowal of kindness on one who has no claim on it, right? We don't want to have any claim on the grace of God, nor can we adequately compensate. We can't pay it back, right? God's grace is this idea of undeserved. None of us deserve to be treated with grace, and we can never, ever pay back. It's impossible. But that's who God is. He's gracious. That's why our hearts must be established in grace. We must, we never should forget it. And some of the greatest hymns, I think, speak to us about grace, don't they? Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all our sin. How can my tongue describe it? Where does its praise begin? So many others, amazing grace, how sweet a sound that saved a wretch like me. Wonderful grace of our loving Lord. And we could go on and on. Grace is... A, is is a charming sound, melodious to the ear. <laughs> we just go, I could go all morning. I just love the idea of the grace of God. And so turn to me because I am gracious. I want to, as it were, to pour my blessing on you that's not deserved. Yeah, you do deserve judgment. But if you'll simply turn to me, I want to deal with you in grace. Oh, how wonderful it is 
to be dealt with in grace, to cast yourself on God's grace. And so he says he's gracious. And then he's merciful. It's that idea of the, the, the kindness that springs from the, the depths of his emotions. He's a, he, he is merciful. Uh, tender feelings are involved here. Uh, he's slow to anger. This is an amazing word. In, in the Hebrew, I've been told, I'm not an expert, but it, it, it's the idea of somebody who has, literally has the idea of a long of nose, a long of nose. And the idea is this. It depicts a God who takes, as it were, a deep breath and holds it for a long time before breathing out his anger. You get that idea? So it's, it, isn't it wonderful, by the way, that, <laughs> that God can hold his breath a long time <laughs> before anger comes? That's the idea. Somebody who can, uh, down in uh, the Bahamas where I've just been, um, a lot of them um, in the olden days when they would dive for crawfish and conch, um, they would free dive and many of them can hold their breath it seems like for an inordinate amount of time and they can still do that they because they've grown up with that that's how that's how they earned a living now of course they use a proper breathing apparatus and all the rest of it but they had a reputation of being people who could hold their breath a long time to deep dive down for conch or whatever well the lord slow to anger long of nose the idea of somebody who can take a deep breath and hold it for a long time before breathing out his anger. Aren't we glad that he's a long-suffering God? Uh, has he not been long-suffering with us? <laughs> so many times. Patient, long-suffering. He's never uh, uh, failing to show long-suffering towards us. And so he says, uh, again, as he describes the characteristics of God, uh, he, he says, slow to anger and then of great kindness. That's a word, hesed, which is a very interesting word. And uh, it's, it's the idea of loving kindness. It's translated as mercy sometimes. Uh, I think of that lovely hymn, in loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And so, again, we just thank the Lord for his loving kindness uh, and it's, it implies his faithfulness to his covenant-keeping people or his covenant people, willing to... <clears throat> and then it tells us that God uh, is also willing here to reconsider, slow to anger of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. He's willing to reconsider his judgments. They're not fixed in stone. His threatenings of wrath are given so that the wicked may change. And where repentance is true, God, in consistency with his own character, withdraws the sentence of condemnation. And so that's the idea of him repenting of the evil. It was, he, he, he's, it's not fixed in stone. He, he said in 1 through 11, he's going to send this, this judgment of a second locust, a plague so severe, unprecedented and yet he says if they repent that god may repent him of the evil or the calamity that was about to be bestowed upon his people and so again it's a wonderful thing that god is willing to do this so we'll, we'll consider that more before we're done with this study but i just think it's a wonderful thing to know that god is willing to do that in verse 14, it says, Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meal offering and a drink offering unto the Lord our God? So here's the, again, an, a question that's, uh, that's been asked. Who knows if he will? But there's a sense of hope here in this answering, uh, that the people are coming to God in repentance Based on the knowledge they have of his character, there is the hope that he will defer the judgment. That's the idea. And so um, <clears throat> the Lord would instead leave a blessing behind. What a wonderful thing that he leave a blessing. And of course, that blessing would be such 
that it would even not just feed them, meet their needs, but it would provide enough to furnish his own table. Because remember that the offerings that he uh, were brought to him, in a sense, came uh, from the bounty of the land. And so the, the meal offerings, the drink offerings, all the various offerings came as a result of the abundance of harvest. And it is interesting, isn't it, that when we come as worshipers, we come to remember the Lord on the Lord's Day morning, all we ever give is what he's already given to us. As we've been reading the scriptures, he, through the Spirit, has shown us lovely thoughts concerning his son. And we only bring back to him that which he has previously given to us. He's the one that opened our eyes to see the beauties of Christ in the scriptures. And we come back and we just present it to him. But he gave it to us in the first place. And what a wonderful thing it is. By the way, this last Lord's Day, we just had the most amazing remembrance meeting. It was absolutely fabulous. I mean, just from start to finish, Spirit of God impressed a theme on the meeting. No, no variation. It was just, it was one of those, you almost wanted to do a fist pump at the end of it. It was so exciting. It was wonderful. So again, who knows if he'll return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meal offering and a drink offering unto the Lord. Notice um, leaving behind something. Back in verse 3, we, we had that same language. In chapter 2, verse 3, fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. What would be left, if they didn't repent, what would be left behind <laughs> would be a desolate wilderness. Now he's saying, if they will respond correctly and come in sincere repentance, who knows if instead he leave behind not a barren wilderness, but leave behind a blessing. What a difference. A blessing left behind. Now, again, I want to just tie this in a little bit with a, another scripture. If you turn with me to uh, another one of the minor prophets, and we want to look at Jonah. The, the prophet Jonah. In chapter 3. And notice again this uh, same kind of question that's being asked in verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. So the king of Nineveh, used similar words. Who can tell if God will return and repent, turn away from his fierce anger? And now his own people are taking the same tactic. Who knows? If we come in genuine repentance, the Lord will turn around and leave behind him a blessing. So now we come to the second little section, beginning in verse 15 through 17. And once more, we are confronted with this alarm blowing, this siren, this trumpet, blow the trumpet in Zion. We already uh, saw it in chapter 2, verse 1, blow you a trumpet in Zion, send an alarm in my holy mountain. Uh, but there's a different reason now for this blowing the trumpet. The shofar trumpet has already sounded in chapter 1. It was a call, an alarm. Now it's to call an assembly. They were to flee from God's wrath in verse 1. Now they're to flee into his arms to receive mercy. There's a difference, right? Fleeing from his wrath in verse 1 because the, the locust invasion is coming. Now instead, an alternative is being presented to them. Instead of fleeing from his wrath and judgment, why not flee into his arms to receive his mercy? And so the trumpet calls them, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. And the words kind of just jump one after another. Blow the trumpet, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. The idea is a sense of urgency here. 
business has to be done. We need to get this taken care of. There's urgency here. True repentance to bring the soul back to God is an urgent matter. It's not to be put off. Let's blow the trumpet. Let's call this solemn assembly. And so it's it, the whole idea is to bring the soul back into right communion with God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. And so that's what God wants them to do, to call this solemn assembly. And as we think of this solemn assembly, I want you to notice who's to attend. And so, uh, and I want you to see that there's, there's to be no absenteeism. Everybody, this is so serious. Everybody in society is called to be involved in this. So he says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber, the bride out of her closet. And so the idea of, of this imagery is this time of repentance for God's people, it, it's so urgent that there's no time for business as usual. And, and so, for instance, um, w w this this just it requires urgent attention. We've got to do this, and we've got to do it now. Therefore, now, remember, we, we saw that already. And so what he says is, okay, w what about the bridegroom and the bride? Listen, cancel the honeymoon. You, 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 you can't do This is too important. Just put the honeymoon on hold, cancel the cruise, come to the <laughs> come to the assembly and let's get this dealt with, right? Forget the honeymoon plans. Um, what about uh, gather the children, those that suck the breasts? Uh, yeah, bring your kids. Don't worry about that, right? Bring them along. Don't have to find a babysitter. You don't have to. You just come along. Uh, this we've got to get this taken care of. Everybody needs to be involved in this, and so it's almost like everything has to be suspended: domestic issues, civil issues, matrimonial issues, social issues, ceremonial. Everything's on hold. This is paramount. We've got to give attention to this. So the newlyweds cancel the honeymoon. Families uh, often used as an excuse not to come to the meeting. I need family time or family issue. No, forget that. Come. We've got to deal with this. Everybody has to be there. The elders, likewise, to be found there. Old and young, male and female, all to join in to implore the mercy of Jehovah with this impending judgment. Leaders among God's people uh, must lead in this way as well. Verse 17, let the priests, uh, the ministers of the Lord, uh, weep. It was they're, they're the ones that that are supposed to take the lead. It's not the case of saying, well, the people need to repent. You know, it's interesting is that God's best leaders, they own themselves as part of the problem. I, I love Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter nine. And all the way through it, it's we have sinned, right? He's leading by example. You see the same in, in books like Nehemiah, where again, these men lead by taking ownership it's not, or if those people just get their act together, no, we're part of the problem. And so there's genuine leadership in all of this. And so they, they're to come. Uh, the priesthood was to be in its place. The altar was there representing the power of sacrifice. And on the porch, the house of the Lord representing his holy presence. And what are they crying out? Spare they, they want the Lord to spare, implies that God's people deserve judgment, but they're pleading for mercy. And so they come together and they say, spare thy people, O Lord. They remind God that in their prayer, Lord, spare your people. These are your people. He reminds they belong to him. He's providing a, a motivation for mercy. God, these are your people. These are the ones you brought out of Egypt. These are the ones you've done so much for. Spare your people. And then he says, do not give your heritage, thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Telling God that mercy to his people will actually bring glory to him among the nations. But if he judges them, it may cause reproach amongst the nations. In other words, it's all about his name. Lord, if you would show mercy on us 
and not bring the judgment you promised, think of what this will do to the heathen. They're looking on and they're observing us and they're saying, oh, what kind of a God treats his people like this? But if you hold back your mercy and instead send blessing, then the people will know that you're amongst us. And so there's a sense of the idea of reminding God. It's all about your name. It's like Joshua, uh, when Ai defeated uh, Israel, he fell on his face and he said, God, what will become of thy great name, O Lord? And we, we want his name to be magnified. And so as we come together in repentance, remind it's all about your name, Lord. Well, how's this going to look for you? And so uh, we don't want the reproach of the heathen. God, you have a vested interest in your people. You have a vested interest in their testimony. And so we don't want that cynicism of the nations to say, where is their God? We want them to be silenced. We want them to, uh, to not have anything to say reproachfully against us. So in concluding thoughts about this little section, is there any relevance to us? Well, it is interesting, isn't it? We've we've thought about the book of Revelation and we've looked at the seven churches. And I don't know if you remember, but one of the things the Lord calls five out of the seven churches to is repentance. Corporate repentance. Five out of the seven. And he says that if you don't, there'll be consequences. Lampstands taken away pretty serious divine judgment the lord's right judgment must first begin at the house of god and so is there not a practical lesson for us could it be that part of our spiritual barrenness is that we have never come to a place of sincere repentance of genuine brokenness in the presence of God. Remember that God, who he is, gracious, merciful, all of these things, but what God cannot resist is a broken, contrite heart. Thou wilt not despise, O Lord. David knew that for all of his failings, David understood something of the heart of God. He knew that God couldn't resist a broken heart. If there was more brokenheartedness amongst us, there might be a lot more blessing amongst us. But we have to get real. God wants reality. So easy to fall into the trap of drawing near to him with our lips, but being far from him in our hearts. May God search us all. None of us are immune from playing the game from being actors, from going through the motions, from concentrating on externalism without inward reality. And God is looking for reality in the inward parts. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.